Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's begin the next panel. Uh, okay, so far we've been listening to fascinating panel discussions. Um, I would like to welcome you now to the first panel with actual papers. Um, um, I, I will be strict with time limits, uh, 15 minutes um, for each presentation, please. Um, I'm fascinating, fascinated to hear the, the papers that we will have today uh, in this panel because um, so far we've been speaking about various topics, but these countries that we have right now in this panel, they, they haven't been really uh, discussed so far, uh, at least not in depth. Um, so I'm, I'm really thrilled. I will begin by introducing the first speaker, Dr. Bur Burkhard Olszowski, my dear friend from Oldenburg. <laughs> um, he is member of the academic staff uh, of the Federal Institute for the History of and Culture of Germans in Eastern Europe, the co-organizer of the conference. He researches late modern European history, 19th and 20th century German and Polish history and the Polish-German relations as well as Silesian and Prussian history um, and the European uh, politics of history and memory. Um, recently, he has edited a book entitled Akteur im Stilen Ennomea und die Aussöhnung mit Polen und Juden, which is de devoted to Ennomea and the Polish-German reconciliation. So, Burkhardt, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you Bartosz, thank you Bartek for your nice introduction. Uh, first, let me as a co-organizer, when we and Bartek, we are the well, main organizers, uh, the practical ones, let me welcome you in particular those who I haven't yet uh, welcomed personally. So now, uh, we already heard about a lot about the German Ostpolitik and I would like to well, to introduce you my thoughts, my consideration. Uh, the invasion of Ukraine um, on February 24th of <coughs> February caused a deep shock in European states, but also in the world, and put family certainties into questions. What are the consequences of this history turning point for the Eastern policies or for the Ostpolitik of the Federal Republic of Germany? In order to give you a cursory answer to this question, I would like to take a closer look at the history of German's Ostpolitik and the attitude towards, primarily towards Russia. Uh, let me begin very briefly describing the history of the emergence of German Ostpolitik. Remarkably, West German Ostpolitik had one of its most original important origins in the building of the Berlin War and the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, which can rightly be described as a caesura in the world history. The political scientist Richard Löwenthal, he was a professor at a free university, uh, linked the outcome of Cuban Missile, missile Crisis with the Berlin Crisis a year earlier and came to the following conclusion, quote, the consequence of the wall was a consolidation of a Soviet status quo in Central Europe. The consequences of the missile crisis was a consolidation of the West position in world politics, including its position in West Berlin. The turn towards world political detente still initiated by Kennedy but also by Khrushchev as a counterpart take place on this basis. End of quotation. I think and all, all, all other things uh, that Löwenthal's analysis, well there is something which has been proved um, because on 10 June 19 63, Kennedy announced a strategic, 
strategy for peace in a speech at, at the American University in Washington, D.C., um, where he modified, modified um, the famous words of his predecessor, Woodrow Wilson, who in April 1917 said, the word must be safe for democracy. And Kennedy said, and followed, quote, if we cannot end our differences now, we can at least help make the world safe for diversity, end of quotation. Kennedy thus laid the foundation of the Western policy of detente into which the new Ostpolitik was the first social democratic chancellor of the Federal Republic, Willy Brandt, was integrated a few years later in the narrow sense of the world. German Ostpolitik aimed to achieve a balance with the Soviet Union, but also, and that's quite important, um, with the Central Eastern European states, ultimately to overcome the status quo, in particular through the political and economically conceived principle of the change through reapproachment. In the late 60s and um, first half of the 70s, particularly after uh, the Prague Spring or the depressing of Prague Spring, uh, securing, securing its European acquis became a paramount of importance for the Soviet Union. These circumstances created the precondition of the conclusion of the treaties with Eastern Europe and the adoption of the CSCA Final Act in Helsinki in 1975. 25 years after the Second World War, the German Ostpolitik was carried by the impulse to achieve an understanding even, and that's quite important, in particular to Poland and the Czech Republic, so after the Second World War, um, the reconciliation with those countries. One of the fruits was that the image of a revisionist West Germany propagated for decades in Warsaw and Prague by the governments was removed or even disappeared. Of course, this also went hand in hand with a serious backlash of legitimization of the communist leadership there. The dominant theme of Ostpolitik was the safeguarding and further development of what had been achieved uh, for divided Germany in the first phase of Ditton in the 1970s. With the emergence of a solidarity, so the Solidarność movement, which was what, <clears throat> a breakthrough then, uh, the whole opposition uh, history in, in Central and Eastern Europe, um, 1980 in Poland, the previous Ostpolitik reached its limits. This was because the two goals of detente, strategic stability of the system and democratic freedoms for the people came into an internal contradiction. Preserving the status quo, at the same time allowing it to be undermined by opposition from below couldn't get together. In this perspective, Solidarność appeared for the Western policy or for the advocates of Ostpolitik as a threat of peace, an assessment shared by Willy Brandt, Helmut Bahr, Egon Bahr, and others. But there were also social democrats who thought differently. They were politically less influential although they were theoretically, to some extent, influential. I just named Gesine Schwan, Heinrich August Winkler, Hans Koschnick, and Karl Kaiser. The CDU under Chancellor Helmut Kohl essentially continued this Ostpolitik, also avoiding contacts with East Central European opposition, oppositionists and opposition movements for a long time. The peaceful revolution 
uh, of Central Eastern Europe that began in Poland and Hungary um, in 1989 were welcomed in the Federal Republic and worldwide. Uh, the contribution of German Ostpolitik to this development was gladly and underly emphasized in Germany. The Federal Republic benefited greatly from these upheavals, but the strikers in Poland since 1980 and the demonstrators in the, the GDR in autumn 1989 had a far greater share in this than German official policy. In contrast to some Polish oppositionists, German reunification in 1990 had not been in the horizon of the expe expectations for a long time of the Ostpolitik. With the collapse of the Soviet bloc and the beginning of NATO and EU enlargement in the 90s, the erroneous assumption that the establishment of international security was an ethical and strategically unproblematic task, a misconception that was based primarily on two false assessment. The low cost protection of Western Europe by US troops in general, and in Germany in particular, in addition, Germany had been surrounded exclusively by friendly nations for more than 30 years and was closely linked to them in alliances. This favorable geographic and political situation of the unified Germans and the confidence and the reliability of their allies strengthened the foreign policy and was also a continuity of the Ostpolitik in the late Helmut Kohl era. This happened despite the first warning signs. We already heard it, the Chechen war, the first and the second Chechen war, and increasing doubts about Russian stability and suitability for democracy during Boris Yeltsin's years in power. After 1990-1991, the now all-German Eastern policy towards Russia was continued in essential points. Now, under the, the, the banner, reapproachment through integration. And it went along partly also with the conception of Eastern partnership by the European Union and had included the two optimistic plans and views about the modernization or the potential modernization of Russia. This idea was in particular backed uh, by the assumption that this kind uh, of treaty and cooperation uh, was based not just on industrial goods, but also on the energy sector, in particular uh, gas and oil, despite the warning voices from the Baltic states and from Poland. The Nord Stream project, we already heard about this, of a gas pipeline through the Baltic Sea, which Gerhard Schröder agreed on with the Russian president shortly before leaving his chancellery in 2005, was politically and morally disastrous. It was clear from the outset that this project was contrary to fundamental interests of gas trends sit country like Ukraine, but also Poland, and met with serious reservations from the part of several East Central European members, but also from the EU and later on uh, from the U United States. But you have, well, well, we have to admit that the most genius advocates of this project were not exclusively um, politicians from the SPD, but great influence had the German industry, but also the ranks uh, of both 
major parties, also the Christian Democrats and the Christian Social Democrats, um, then are part of the story. The new major territory conquest war, so and now we are by the 24th of February, um, was connected to think, with a new assumption or almost a shock. Uh, not since the end of the Second World War on, May, on 8 May um, 1945 has been such a war in Europe fought between the two largest land powers on the continent. The Russian invasion of the Ukrainian <clears throat> means destruction both of people and the country's building and infrastructure. This may have been the tipping point for a long period of peace to a long period of war, but we don't know it yet. The challenges we are facing concerning also the German policy and the so-called time of change or Zeitenwende. The Foreign Minister Annalena Berber called it, we woke up in another world. And since then, the foreign policy, it's a balancing act. On the one hand, the gov government is required to support Ukraine with weapons in recognition of their right of self-defense. On the other hand, it must do everything to prevent itself as a NATO state from getting into the war against Russia, if only because it's also obliged to prevent harm to the German people. We might discuss about it, but that's an argument which we have heard in, in Germany at least. The interesting is the debate in Germany. It's cuts across all parties. It goes to the main parties, but also to churches, many institutions, even citizens. In the process, people do not shy away even from legal actions. Just to give you one example, um, Gabriele Kronenschmalz, who is really a, <clears throat> a Russophile journalist, um, put on a jail an East European young historian, Francisca Davis uh, from Munich, just to give you an example. And on the other hand, the SPD, with their party leader Lars Klingbeil, in October last year, outlined an official renunciation of the previous Ostpolitik and the previous Russia policy, combined with the admission of serious mistake done in the Ostpolitik. Coming back to the conception of Ostpolitik, and that's my conclusion, uh, Russia of today does not defend a status quo as it did in the 1970s, but it's a radically revisionist power. It wants to restore the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union, which was dissolved in 1991. This results in a confrontational course toward West, to which the latter cannot react with compliance, but only with determination. It is time to spell out a fundamental new German policy towards Russia and Ukraine. It must be a more clear-sided towards Russia autocratic, cultural and religious and imperial tradition and draw appropriate conclusions from these challenges. Last but not least, I have also to say something as a historian, uh, there I am. Um, I'd like to stress that also has a historical and historiographical dimension, the times, the turn of times, the Zeitenwende, that it means After the war in Ukraine, at latest, Germany and other states will have to come to terms 
is a failed policy towards Russia. Angela Merkel, but also other politicians, including entrepreneurs, have to come to terms with their own policy or their contribution to this policy. And they, these people have it in their hands whether this happened with them or against them. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Burkhardt. I was listening to, I was thinking maybe we should simply uh, name, uh, use the, the term uh, Russia politics instead of Ostpolitik, Ostpolitik or uh, broaden the broaden number of countries that we understand under this term. Okay, but that's for the later discussion. Um, the next speaker is Olgrich Tuma. Uh, between 1998 and 2017, he was the director of the Institute for Contemporary History of the Czech Academy of Sciences. Um, Olgrich Tuma has been a member of domestic and foreign scientific bodies, including doctoral program councils at the Faculty of Social Sciences at the Charles University. He was in various editorial boards. Uh, he is also a member of the Scientific Council of the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity and of the Hannah Arendt Institute für Totalitarmus uh, Forschung at the Technical University in Dresden. He researches contemporary history, the post-1945 history of Czechoslovakia and the Cold War history, but originally he also was focusing on medieval history and Byzantine history. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Bartosz, for your introduction. It was longer than my paper will be. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation to Burkhardt and Bartosz and, and so on. It's always a pleasure to be here among dear friends, so to say, so dear friends. Uh, I, will, I will add a small stone to the great mosaic created during this conference, and so the stone will be about the, about the attitude, Czech attitude uh, to the Russian aggression against, against Ukraine, and I will deal more with the attitude of the Czech public so to say, of Czech society. And to explain that, uh, I will have to go back to the past because I think there is still an uh, important impact of the past on the present. So the attitude of the Czech Republic to the Russian aggression against Ukraine has been steadfast and stable since the very beginning, no matter whether reflected in political statements of all constitutional authorities, deliveries of weapons and other material, humanitarian aid or help to refugees. Together with Polish Premier and Slo Slovenian President, Czech Prime Minister Petr Fiala was the first foreign statesman to visit Kiev relatively soon after the invasion. Czech deliveries of weapon systems are comparable to uh, those provided by much larger and richer West European countries. Uh, there are now almost 700,000 Ukrainians living in the Czech Republic, some half a million of them under a special regime of temporary protection of refugees. So compared to the Czech Republic's own population, this is among the highest proportion among all European countries. The attitude described above is unquestionably a result of the generally pro-Atlantic and pro-EU orientation of the right center government, which had assumed the office shortly before the aggression, just a few weeks before. However, the policy enjoys relatively strong public support, which takes on various forms. It is manifested in the assistance provided to refugees um, and in successful fundraising campaigns to help the Ukraine and so on. The issues of continuing support to the Ukraine and the risk of war and they were open, those questions, those issues were opened during the re recent presidential election in Czech Republic, did not play a major role in the presidential campaign, or better say, it did not bring success to the candidate who built the final stage of his campaign on this topic, so Andrei Babish. Uh, <clears throat> although he did it very, very carefully and he, he didn't speak about against the aid, but he spoke in favor of looking for alternative solutions. And 
<clears throat> recently elected new president of Czech Republic, Peter Pavel is a certainly a politician with a clearly pro-Western, that means pro-NATO and anti-Russian orientation, and he won a, a sweeping victory in election. So how can this attitude of the Czech public be explained? Of course, by a synergy of different factors. Definitely not by the popularity of the present government itself, which because of economic and social problems is at a very low level. And not even, I would say, by sympathies to the Ukrainians as such. In fact, for most Czechs, I mean ordinary citizens, men of the street, simply they perceived Ukrainians just two years ago as a different Russians or other Russians, something like that. Of course, there is a sympathy with the victim of aggression and solidarity with, with such a victim, victim. But I think there are other factors. And in my opinion, the reason is the generally negative attitude toward Russia among Czech society. It is certainly based on sophisticated and actually well-founded arguments, historical, political, security arguments, and so on. But, but there are also, I would say, prejudices and feelings of cultural superior superiority against Russia and Russians relatively frequent among Czechs. It is, not an, it is not an accident that social networks and even relatively respectable Czech media of, often accentuate information to the effect that the Russian army is nothing more than a gang of bad regled and untrained muziks with cardboard ballistic vests and rusty submachine guns and that Russian generals are incorrigible morons. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not that much. Uh, the roots of the prevailing mindset of the Czech society described above must be sought in the, also sought in the past, or rather in the interpretation of the past. At the same time, it must be noted that there are more than just a few aspects supporting pro-Russian orientation in the Czech historical memory, and I would start with this. For instance, even Václav Havel, although the fact is not mentioned very often, published relatively conciliatory and forthcoming words addressed to Russia in a certain phase of his political career. In the early 90s, he repeatedly stated that, quote, any future European arrangement is unthinkable without Russia, or that Russia is an integral part of Europe, or the last quote, positive developments in Europe as a whole is unthinkable, without positive developments in Russia. But in fact, he, uh, he <coughs> stopped commenting on the position of Russia in the United Europe as soon as he realized that such views were not very convenient for Washington. And as the Czech president, it is since 1993, Václav Havel concentrated his foreign policy efforts predominantly on securing a NATO membership for the Czech Republic. Uh, and anyway, in the... Uh, in the past, there were certain tradition of Czech sympathies for Russia, and I would have to emphasize that Czech attitude toward Russia was historically of a specific nature. It was an indirect relationship, more or less until World Wars. The Czech lands did not have any border with Russia and the Czech history, unlike that of, for example, Poland, was free of direct relations and thus any conflicts with Russia. But the perception of Russia in 19th century was based mainly on admiration of Russian culture and literature rather than on realistic political concepts. And in fact, there was a prevailing skepticism in, among Czech, Czech politicians from the mid, mid 19th century. For instance, František Palacký, a founder of Czech historiography, but also of Czech modern policy in his famous letter to Frankfurt when he rejected an invitation to join the Frankfurt Parliament explained that one thing, I am not a German, I'm a Czech, and the other thing, according to his opinion, Austria, Austrian Empire has to, has to uh, survive because this is the main, uh, main instrument to prevent the expansion of imperialist Russia into, into Central Europe, and for František Palacký it was the ultimate evil. And the same opinion was of Karel Havlíček Borovský, the founder of modern Czech journalism, and, uh, and uh, or later also of Tomáš Garik Masaryk, both as a scholar and as a politician. And in fact, Masaryk's book, uh, Russia and Europe, published just before 1914, I think is worth to be read even, even today. But 
if there was an occasion, the Czech politicians were able to play uh, the card of pro-Russian sympathies, for instance, 1867, after the Austro-Hungarian compromise, when hopes to achieve a similar Austrian-Czech modus vivendi were frustrated, all leading Czech politicians traveled as a manifestation to, to Russia to visit the ethnographic exhibition in, uh, in Moscow. But it was more a gesture. So uh, what changed the situation was the Great War, 1914. I would say it was for the first time when the Czechs were really in, uh, in, in, in touch with, with Russians. The war was very unpopular in Czech society, uh, but the sympathies towards Serbia and Russia were very high. The Czech soldiers, when, when leaving their uh, home cities, uh, for a front line, used to used to sing a folk song with a little bit different words. We are marching against the Russian, and we don't know why. Uh, Karel Karamaz, who was a leading politician of the beginning of the 20th century, even was thinking about a, a Slavic empire or Slavic confederation as an outcome of war led by Russian Tsar, and he even prepared a something like a constitution of, of such an empire. But then during, uh, during the war, um, prevailed program represented by Tomasz Garek Masaryk, which relied on cooperation of Western democratic countries um, in his struggle to, uh, to fight for independent, uh, independent Czechoslovakia. But still, the very important part of this struggle took part uh, in, in Russia itself, the most numerous Czechoslovak units the Czechoslovak Legion were built in Russia, something 1918, something like 70,000 men. So they were built especially with support of the provisional government, 1917. But their greatest military engagement uh, was not with Austrian and German army, but against the Bolsheviks, so against Russians. So that was, I think, a great paradox. Uh, they stayed in Russia until 19. 20 being involved in, in Russian civil war and, and so. Uh, but in the interwar period, uh, after the birth of an independent Czechoslovak state, there was a different situation. If there was any admiration for Soviet Union or Russia, it was based more on ideological, it is communist ideas, not on nationalist reasons. But the situation changed again due to the Second World War when Czech pro-Russian sympathies and hopes experienced the second climax. The disappointment over the behavior of the Western powers in Munich, the tragic experience of the German occupation, the role of the Red Army in the defeat of Nazi Germany and the liberation of Czechoslovakia significantly increased the feelings of admiration of and friendship towards the Soviet Union, which was commonly perceived as Russia. I think that there was no other Central or Eastern European country, <clears throat> maybe except for Bulgaria or until the Soviet Yugoslav breakup Yugoslavia, in which the attitude to Russia was as positive as in Czechoslovakia. But those sympathies started, together with the support of regime, to fade away, and they were dealt a mortal blow by the invasion of the Warsaw Pact armies in 1968. And those pro-Russian sympathies were then replaced by hatred, mistrust, and contempt, which have survived in the Czech spiritual space until now. Uh, they always reach the, their peak on the anniversary of the intervention, which is frequently discussed in August, when the media, politicians, public remind and discuss the, this dark side of Czechoslovak history. And in fact, this issue of 68 invasion is reminded almost every day since February of the, of the last year. I think it's not necessary to explain I. What I would uh, remind is also the fact that when in Russian, uh, Russian media or political space uh, they were cases somehow to retell the story of 68 invasion in the style of former Soviet propaganda as was a, uh, as was a documentary movie transferred in Russian television 1915 or as was the proposal uh, to give the soldiers who participated in occupation of Czechoslovakia the status of veterans. 
it happened 19, so then, um, then the reaction of the Czech public and mass media and even politicians was very, very, uh, very uh, resolute and, um, and so on. And um, uh, even, even Miloš Zeman, who had, President Miloš Zeman, who otherwise was continuously criticized for his overly obliging policy or rhetoric toward Russia, criticized very, very resolutely those cases. But I think there is another factor in the generation of anti-Russian sentiment, and it was the devout policy and rhetoric of the communist regime, which has been praising and extolling ad absurdum all things Soviet for 40 years. Soviet flags, signs reading with the Soviet Union forever, which were permanently present in the public space, were incessantly supplemented by reminders in what the Soviet Union can be an example for Czechs and Slovaks. I would just mention, for instance, that one Russian journalist uh, describes in his memoirs how perplexed he was when he visited a restaurant in Prague in mid-60s and he saw a huge sign there on the wall which read Soviet gastronomy, our example, when he compared still relatively luxurious Prague restaurants with the poverty of similar establishments in Soviet Union. He did not know whether it was a, an irony or a provocation, but it was not. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> Soviet science, technology, art, and culture were continuously extolled and reminded of. And even sporting matches with Soviet teams had to be reported in a special way. The comment had to clearly, in radio or TV, indicate that there was no rivalry or determined fight for victory, but a good sports show between friends conducted in the spirit of fair play. And this approach was particularly absurd in the case of ice hockey matches which the Czech and Slovak public, I think so, viewed after 1968 as a sort of a proxy war against the occupiers of, of August 68. So consequences of the obsequious and ridiculous policy of the communist regime, and I think, in fact, it was more a policy of Czechoslovak communists than of Moscow, were utterly contraproductive. The policy, of course, did not generate any new pro-Russian sympathies and failed to retain the old ones, particularly since 68. On the contrary, it produced feelings of inferiority and subordination, which the public mindset was increasingly compensating and balancing by perceived cultural superiority and general Soviet, it means Russian backwardness and barbarism, for instance, there were, and I do remember it, <laughs> for example, many stories circulating in the society after August 1968, describing how Soviet soldiers did not know what water toilets were for and were using them for utterly different purposes. Maybe it was not true, but, but it's significant. The initial, after 1945, relatively strong sympathies turned into contempt and hatred during the decades of the communist rule and particularly in the 70s and 80s. And as a matter of fact, they have survived until now. After all, since the demise of the Soviet Union, Russia has done very little or nothing apart from very formal official apologies for the 1968 intervention, which were not accompanied by any significant and comprehensible gesture to send that mindset of the Czech public, so nothing like Willy Brandt uh, on the knees in front of the uh, monument of ghetto in Warsaw, uh, anything like that. So the very vigorous attitude of the Czech government to the Russian aggression in the Ukraine is combined with long-term trends of modern Czech Russophobia, and the government policy is accepted and supported by a majority of Czech population. That's my summary. Of course, certainly not by anyone and not in every respect. So thank you for attention. Thank you very much. Now uh, a paper that probably all of us are very much looking forward to uh, because Professor uh, Pock will hopefully explain to us the special Hungarian case. Um, Professor Pock is a historian and a senior researcher at the Institute of Advanced Studies Kershek. From 1996 until 2018, he was deputy director of the Institute of History at the recent research center for humanities at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Um, he is also chairman of the ENRS Academic Council. His publications and courses cover three major fields, that is the European political and intellectual history in the 19th and 20th centuries, the history of modern European historiography with um, special regards to uses of history and the theory of 
uh, and methodology of history writing. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. All I need is now my PowerPoint. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you very much for inviting me and congratulations to the organizers. Uh, my short presentation is divided into four parts. The very first part is talking about history. The second part is a chronology of mainly mainstream government actions during the period between the beginning of February last year and more or less the present. The third part is about some basic figures that you need to understand the <coughs> Hungarian government policies and the Hungarian society three actions that I'm going to talk about here as well. And finally, I am going to talk about some broader interpretations into which the, the, both the uh, government policies and the social reactions to that uh, fit. So, uh, very few remarks about history. So, if you want to ask any Hungarian concerning uh, Russia, there are two dates that come into the mind of people. That is 1848-49, the Hungarian uh, revolution and struggle for liberty, where the Russian troops played an important role in crushing it. And, of course, 1956, when the Russian, uh, the Soviet troops uh, uh, crushed the, the Hungarian Revolution. As far as uh, Ukraine is concerned, it's a bit more complicated because if you think of the history of great Hungarian imperial expansion going back to the 13th century, that were going in the 13th century up to what is now today the southwestern part of, uh, of the Ukraine and some of the greatest Hungarian uh, historical myth and historical stories are relating to this uh, period in the 13th century. However, it's much closer to us when it came during the period between 1918 and 1920, various attempts in the aftermath of the First World War at, Hung at uh, Ukrainian statehood that had an impact also of the developments in Hungary. But as we get closer, uh, uh, the so-called basic treaty between Hungary and Ukraine is very important to be recalled because that was signed on uh, December the 6th, 1991, that is five days after the independence of the Ukraine was declared. Uh, this basic treaty was signed in Kiev. Uh, it went in line with another basic treaties, and there were two elements of this treaty. One, on the Hungarian side, that borders, as given, are accepted and guaranteed. And on the Ukrainian side, the minority rights, which is the major concern concerning uh, Ukraine uh, in the past and also in the present, so that minority rights uh, would be uh, respected. Uh, it is interesting that the government had great difficulties at the, of the time to push through the basic treaty because within the government there were fewer forces supporting it than in the opposition. So it is the complexity of Hungarian politics at that time that this could happen. And I also should like, I think it hasn't yet been mentioned, the so-called Budapest Memorandum of uh, December the 5th, 1994 where uh, the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom, the, and the United States uh, prohibited the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom, the United States from threatening or using military force or economic coercion against Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan as well, in return <coughs> for the Ukraine giving up the nuclear weapons. So, so much about the historical background and uh, and now let's go to the chronology of uh, the event uh, of 1920 to 1923. On 1st uh, of uh, February, our Prime Minister, Mr. Orban, went to see uh, Putin in Moscow. Uh, it was communicated in a way also as a kind of a peace mission, but the main achievement, as it was declared, that Hungary succeeded a guarantee for increasing the volume of gas supplies. Uh, for Hungary, whatever happens. 
uh, in the aftermath of the 24th of February, uh, the Prime Minister immediately made a declaration, Facebook, uh, that uh, we, are, we certainly condemn, together with our allies in the EU and the NATO, uh, the military, action, uh, military aggression of Russia, and we very much hope that the European unity can be maintained. Now, we have, you have to keep in mind that at this point, the election campaign in Hungary was going on because the parliamentary elections were taking place uh, on the 3rd of April, and uh, it was immediately integrated into the uh, government propaganda that the opposition, when it was talking about solidarity with the Ukraine, it might mean that also Hungarian soldiers might be sent to support the Ukrainians, which was not the case, but I think this uh, imposing on the opposition the plan of directly intervening into the complaint, I think played a very important role uh, in uh, uh, the success, in the overwhelming success of the government. Now, uh, as far as later statements on behalf of the government concerning the Ukrainian war concerned, they were always put into a broader context. Every year our Prime Minister goes to <coughs> Balványos, a place in Transylvania, and this summer he was talking about a very controversial issue. He said that uh, in, the, in the Carpathian Basin we are not a mixed race, so he was uh, using a very unpopular word. We are simply a mixture of peoples living in our own European homeland. And we have a task and a mission to stop any external invasion, just the same way, so he connected the problem of migration to the, to the, the current situation, and he was arguing, this is what we were fighting um, in uh, 1456, this is why we stopped the Turks at Vienna, and this is also why the French stopped the Arabs at Poitiers. Uh, and uh, this uh, line of argumentation, putting the Ukrainian war into a broader context, continued in Dallas, in the United States, because he was speaking at the Conservative Political Action Conference, and he said that now this is much more than uh, just one uh, regional war. Here uh, there is a war going on uh, because the Hungarians know how to defeat the enemies of freedom on the political battlefield and who are the enemies that are progressive liberals and communists who are more or less the same and I am here to tell you that our values, the nation, Christian roots and family can be successful in the political battlefield. So he is trying to advise, uh, going into uh, a number of further details, uh, how uh, the uh, Republicans in the uh, US should follow the Hungarian example in this uh, type of uh, struggle. Now, uh, there were uh, some similar statements, uh, uh, for example, on the 25th of uh, October, and this has become a main element of, uh, Hung of uh, uh, Hungarian uh, uh, government propaganda, that the military section, the, the economic sections against Russia are defeating, not Russia, but are defeating Hungary and Europe, and therefore, one has to uh, fight against it, and that is a, a poster that you could see in many Budapest cities. that is the sanctions of Brussels are uh, destroying us. And uh, on several occasions, uh, he uh, repeated, and other representatives of the government uh, uh, repeated this. Now, let me come over to some figures. It is very important to uh, keep in mind that the Hungary now borders five countries that owe their statehood or are connected to the end of the USSR and the dissolution of larger multi-ethnic enti entities. Now, there are Hungarians living in Romania, in Slovakia, in Serbia, much smaller number in Croatia and Slovenia, and of course in the Ukraine as well. So that's why uh, the participation 
of uh, Hungary in uh, various actions concerning the support of the Ukraine was always referring to this problem because if uh, Ukrainian soldiers are fighting Russian soldiers to a smaller number, but that also includes Hungarians from Hung members of the Hungarian minority who are uh, there, and there are figures that about 100 and 150 of them have already died. Now, this takes us also to the problem of uh, uh, the number of uh, asylum seekers in Hungary and border crossing. We have to keep in mind that there, were, there are up to the present day, this is a rough estimate, 2.1, 2.2, 3 million border crossings, but that means also, that also includes people who are just commuting, going to and fro. As far as real asylum seekers are concerned, the estimate is to be about 30 or 40,000. Along this line, there were some conflicts on behalf of the official supporters of the asylum seekers and the NGOs, uh, because the official uh, arrangements are pretty strict, but uh, the solidarity of the society, especially during the first months, uh, February, March, April, was extremely strong. But of course, uh, more recently, the, uh, what came into the foreground of uh, political and social discussions is not so much the war itself, but the sanctions, the EU sanctions. And uh, there are very interesting public opinion polls. According to the so-called Eurobarometer, there was a, they checked the social reactions and political reactions to the EU's policy towards Ukraine in 28 countries. And as far as Hungary is concerned, 14% uh, said that well, we fully agree to the EU policy. 45% uh, said more or less we agree. 12% said no, we do not agree at all. 26% said rather not, and 3% uh, had no opinion. However, on the other hand, the government also made a kind of a, sent out a kind of a questionnaire to Hungarian citizens that you were expected to answer either by mail or by, uh, by, by online. And according, to, there were about six million or so, five, six million letters sent out. 1.4 million uh, answers were sent. And out of this 1.4 million, nine, uh, somewhat more than 97% said that no, we do not agree with the sanctions of Brussels. However, you have to keep in mind, if you want to have the broad picture, that at the elections in April, about three million, a little bit more than three million people voted for Fidesz, for the government party, and now it was only 1.4 million who sent back this questionnaire. So it, it, it shows the complexity of the social reactions to that. Now finally, let me come to the, the broader, uh, I, I would say, geostrategic uh, picture. Our Prime Minister on several occasions said that in the long run, Hungary has to face three challenges. One coming from Berlin, the other one coming from Moscow, and the third one coming from Istanbul. Germany is the land of iron chancellors. East, you can find the, the Slavic soldiers people. And in the south, you have got the huge masses of Muslim people. Now, it is our historical task to survive in this environment. It means, on the one hand, that we have to be in good terms with each of them, but it doesn't mean that we have to be on good terms with each of them at the same time. Sometimes we have to be on better terms with one, sometimes on better terms with the other, but this is something that we have to keep in mind. And as far as then, in this broader context, the war itself is concerned, the major message is that this is not Hungary's war. Hungary should give all types of humanitarian aid 
to, to refugees and uh, to Ukraine also in general, but uh, it is a mortal danger if uh, Hungary as part of the Western coalition gets into, into a direct war with Russia. And on the, one of the last uh, interviews, he gave a conversation with journalists uh, on the 26th of January. He said that, well, the West uh, is in war with Russia. He said, that's reality, but we do not want the West to be in a war with Russia. We are pushing for peace, and I have been saying this, he says, uh, from the beginning, and we argue that nobody can win this war. And he was saying that far too many Westerners are deluding themselves about what is really happening and what could happen. And now, finally, even the broader intellectual context now, he, uh, John Mearsheimer, who is the representative of offensive realism, is very popular in Hungary. He was also invited to speak at some uh, officially also very much celebrated event. And this is pushing the responsibility uh, uh, to a great extent, not fully, but it is arguing in favor of the statement that the US has a serious responsibility for the war. Uh, another intellectual supporter of these policies is, is uh, Mr. Scruton, who unfortunately already passed away, but it was one of the last months, it was during the last months of Scruton's life that he got a decoration from, uh, from Mr. Orban. He was being praised for having been a staunch anti-communist all the time and was always supporting the uh, Hungarian uh, opposition. Now, uh, one more example, because we have the opportunity to occasionally uh, figure out, because it is, uh, appears on our Prime Minister's Facebook, what he is reading and what he is recommending us. And uh, it is an even interesting that uh, he popularized this Helen Russell's book about Denmark. Now, Whatever Denmark is doing is very different from what Hungary is doing in many respects, be it economic policy, be it social policy. But the point is not to follow the Danish example. The point is that every country must have its individual policies. And uh, this is uh, how the Danish example is connected to uh, the Hungarian example. Now, uh, le uh, let me uh, conclude by adding uh, some personal comment to this, uh, because uh, I was asked to summarize Hungarian perceptions. I uh, summarize them. Now, but I think what we can learn from this perception is that we are to put this very conflict, which is of course in the foreground of foreign attention, always into some kind of a broader context. Now, whether you agree or disagree with this broader context, that's a matter of discussion. But that we should uh, have a broader context, I think that is something that we can learn uh, from these uh, statements. And to make it more concrete, now my suggestion based on the experiences of the discussion so far, what is going to happen if the focus of international attention for any reason or other is pushed from the Ukraine, from the Russian aggression to something else, to the Near East, to, uh, to China versus the US, etc., we, I think we should also be in a position, and I think we haven't yet discussed this issue, to prepare for these options as well. Because what happens if the US either doesn't want or is no more in a position to further support uh, the Ukraine? Uh, the, the other issue is that I think, and I think that is also something that can be connected to this Hungarian perception, that what we should focus is not only the future of uh, Russia, but also the future of the Ukraine. And because uh, the uh, longer term development, especially for a country that is in the immediate neighborhood of the Ukraine, is also of uh, 
uh, great significance. So thank you very much for inviting me again, and I am very much appreciating that for now, for nearly a decade and a half, I have had the pleasure and the honor of cooperating with NRS. Thank you very much. Um, right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pock. Now, the last speaker is Dr. Juraj Marusiak, who's political scientist, historian, journalist, and translator. Since 1996, he has worked for the Institute of Political Science of the Slovak Academy of Sciences. Since 2009, he has been head of scientific board. Um, in 2013-21, uh, he was a member of the Presidium of Slovak Academy of Sciences. His professional articles are mo uh, mostly about problems of Central and Eastern Europe in 20th and 21st centuries. Okay, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, firstly, I wish to express my thanks uh, uh, to the organizers for inviting me. So uh, the uh, outbreak of uh, the so-called uh, Ukraine crisis in 2013, 2014, um, uh, uh, reopened the topic of relations uh, with Russia in the Slovak society. However, uh, this issue must be, of course, viewed uh, comprehensively. Uh, firstly, it is, of course, the issue of the fundamental geopolitical choice. However, uh, it is uh, also the issue of uh, political regime in Slovakia, uh, just the, the orientation of Slovakia was the topic of Slovak disputes in the uh, 1990s, where also uh, it was a dilemma between pro-Western and pro-Russian uh, foreign policy orientation. Even uh, now, uh, after the, uh, this outbreak of uh, Ukrainian crisis uh, and now the outbreak of war between Russia and Ukraine, already before the parliamentary elections, uh, there uh, were apparent significant differences between uh, political parties uh, regarding the relations with uh, Russian uh, Federation. Uh, so uh, such parties as uh, the, uh, then ruling party Smer Social Democracy uh, and Slovak National Party, but also uh, extremely right, uh, in fact, neo-Nazi People's Party, our Slovak together with some minor political parties like Socialists and Fatherland Party. Uh, they claimed uh, that uh, Russia is not an enemy of Slovakia. They rejected this labeling of Russian Federation as an enemy. And they uh, already, before the parliamentary elections, raised uh, the sharp criticism towards the policy of uh, sanctions imposed against Russia by the European Union and United States. On the other hand, the uh, then opposition, uh, currently the uh, parties of uh, ruling coalition, um, uh, stressed the need to strengthen the Euro-Atlantic cooperation and criticized the policy of rapprochement between parts, uh, between coalition parts uh, to, uh, and Russian uh, Federation. This conflict continued even after the elections and began to escalate towards the end of 2021 in connection with the preparation of bilateral defense agreement, DCA, uh, between Slovakia and the United States. Uh, opposition described it as a limitation of the Slovak sovereignty, uh, but also as a step towards the uh, war against Russia. So uh, uh, there were uh, very crucial moments, uh, country sovereignty and uh, issue of uh, uh, peace. Uh, so from this perspective, this peace rhetoric is uh, very similar to the rhetoric uh, raised by Viktor Orban. However, besides these uh, two issues, geopolitics uh, and uh, uh, issues of war and peace, this uh, debate about Russia, this uh, conflict regarding Russia uh, uh, <clears throat> is uh, uh, also uh, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Attack, attached uh, the um, relations, uh, the, this uh, attitude of Slovaks to the, some crucial memory sites uh, uh, relevant for the formation of the identity of modern Slovak republics. So uh, I will focus mostly on the following data. Uh, Slovak national uprising uh, in uh, August 2044, 
then uh, the day, Victory Day uh, over fascism, uh, which is a national holiday in Slovakia, 8th of May, and uh, also the 21st August 1968 as a, a day of, as a, a day of the Soviet occupation of Czechoslovakia in 1968. So, uh, <clears throat> Uh, here, uh, in this case, I wish also to point out on the uh, person of Alexander Dubček, who is uh, both symbol of uh, uh, this uh, socialism with human face, uh, pra symbol of Prague Spring, uh, as a symbol of democratic socialist tradition, but also uh, he is a symbol of anti-fascist tradition as a participant of the Slovak national uprising. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> Collective memory of uh, contemporary Slovakia is uh, under permanent tensions regarding the interpretation of the period of communism. Because uh, on one hand, uh, this period, especially the last 20 years of communism, have uh, quite enjoyed quite a um, positive image uh, 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 from the perspective of uh, individual memory of the large part of the society. However, this uh, cultural memory is constructed in a quite anti-communist uh, way uh, by the uh, totalitarian interpretation. So according to the official uh, narr narr uh, narratives and official legislation of Slovak Republic, communist regime was uh, uh, is described as a totalitarian and even criminal. Then another uh, source of tension is the relatively positive image of Russian Federation connected with the liberation uh, in 1945. But um, also this uh, anti-fascist Slovak tradition is important, um, uh, for example, for, for, from the perspective of uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, struggle with the so-called historical revisionist policy uh, presented mainly by Hungary and but also by some political circles in Germany uh, who raised the issue of the revision of the so-called Banish decrees uh, adopted uh, during the Second World War and immediately after, after the war. So uh, Russian side, uh, vice versa, um, uh, <coughs> highly um, um, appreciated the Slovak's approach to the care on the military cemeteries and memori memorials dedicated to uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet soldiers. So regarding Russia, uh, Slovakia adopted so-called cosmopolitan approach, uh, uh, how, which, is, uh, uh, which is in the opposition to the um, so-called antagonist approach uh, presented by, for example, Poland or Baltic states. However, uh, in the context of the uh, growing confrontation between uh, Russia and the West uh, in uh, the case of Ukraine, these elements of uh, antagonist approach uh, towards Russia um, uh, have increase, uh, increased uh, in, uh, Slova in Slovakia. So the uh, conflict uh, regarding Russia was present also uh, during the vote in, within the National Council of the Slovak Republic uh, in the parliament uh, immediately after the beginning of Russia's aggression against the Ukraine. Although all, all political parties verbally uh, condemned Russia's aggression, for example, some uh, representatives of the main opposition party, Smer SD, uh, including uh, deputy parties chairman Lubos Blaha and Vladislav Kamenitsky, didn't take part in the vote about the re resolution. And uh, subsequently, the opposition uh, raised the, uh, uh, started to criticize the politics of sanctions against Russia, politics of uh, the supply of weapons towards Ukraine, and uh, um, by, uh, even one uh, marginal politician, but representative of uh, one far-right party, Stefan Harabin, uh, openly supported Russia's aggressions towards Ukraine, saying, uh, I would do exactly what Putin did with regard to the events of uh, Ukraine. So regarding the events 1944-1945, so the question is, uh, question of Slovak's memory dispute is, whom the, whom the victory belongs to? 
So uh, the crucial point is uh, in this uh, debate, symbolical point is the monument of Slavin, uh, monument of the Soviet victory uh, placed on the hill uh, uh, in the uh, uh, center of Bratislava. It's li li it uh, is visible from all, all parts of the city. Slavin remained the central point of the celebrations of the end of the Second World War, uh, all, also after 1980. Nine, but uh, especially since the outbreak of Ukraine crisis 2014, it also became a meeting place for the forces that declared their sympathy for the internal uh, and foreign policy of the Russian Federation. And uh, uh, also uh, it became the place of the conflict between uh, supporters of Russia and uh, supporters of the official foreign policy of the uh, Slovak Republic. So in the very first days after the outbreak of the war, unidentified persons painted uh, Slavin monument in, uh, with Ukrainian national colors. Uh, the same uh, things took place also in uh, other uh, cities of Slovakia. Uh, so the <clears throat> Uh, on the other hand, uh, so this uh, argument uh, was on one hand that Russia's uh, aggression uh, is also um, uh, uh, means the profanation and the desecration of the memory not only of uh, Russian's Red Army fighters, but also Ukrainians, Belarusians, and uh, other Red Army soldiers who sacrificed their lives for liberation of our, our, of uh, Europe against fascism. On the other hand, the followers of Russia also uh, condemned the, uh, the, they didn't condemn the aggression, but they condemned this uh, painting, painting of uh, Slavin. So uh, Slavin uh, is uh, currently uh, very often the place of the opposition gatherings, uh, not only aimed against the Slovak uh, official Slovak foreign policy towards Ukraine, but also against the uh, policy of the Slovak government. One must stress uh, during the last three years, Slovak government, uh, although it is a pro-Western government, became extremely unpopular and nowadays about eight, from 80 to 90 percent uh, of the uh, people in Slovakia expressed distrust to this, uh, to this uh, government. Then uh, we can see split within the Slovak population regarding the celebration of the Victory Day. Uh, some uh, uh, people, especially post-communist uh, members of post-communist union of anti-fascist fighters, but also uh, members of uh, main opposition party, they um, uh, uh, are celebrating the uh, 9th of May. It means, according to the Russian narration, um, uh, as a day of victory over fascism. Uh, all those for Slovakia, the main uh, state holiday is 8th of, uh, 8th of May. Uh, the, in 2022, uh, there took place uh, the, in uh, 9th of May the meeting of uh, pro-Ukrainian activists uh, with the main message, what Ukraine needs most today is liberation from Putin's fascists, uh, just as the world once needed liberation from Hitler fascists. So similar historical par parallel was used in the message to the citizens of Slovakia. Let us not forget that Ukrainians are dying for our freedom too. As in 1945, so today. So this, it means it is, uh, uh, they opposed this policy of Russia's uh, uh, appro appropriation or expropriation of the victory over fascism as by saying that also Ukrainians were the, integra were the integral parts of anti-fascist, uh, uh, of the fight with fascism. Uh, then uh, another uh, historical issue raised during this uh, war is issue of so-called Bandera, U uh, Ukrainian uh, uprisings army. Uh, so uh, especially post-communist uh, and pro-Russian politicians uh, very o are very often referring to Ukrainian regime as a fascist as and Banderit regime. And uh, uh, it is in accordance with the arguments of Russian Federation. 
Even the deputy chairman of uh, this main opposition party, Luboš Blaha, filed a criminal complaint against the president of Slovak Republic, uh, Zuzana Čaputova, for using allegedly uh, banderist greetings, glory to Ukraine, Slava U Ukraini. It uh, is interpreted as a fascist uh, or banderist uh, greeting. So uh, this uh, split in within the Slovak society was also reflected in the commemoration of the Slovak national uprising anniversary. Uh, the opposition part, opposition uh, decided to organize their own celebrations and they boycotted the official celebrations at uh, the SNP Slovak national uprising museum in Banska Bystrica. And uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, yes, uh, yes, I need, yes, I am going, uh, sh just short remarks uh, about 1968. So, although it was a topic of uh, uh, general consensus within the Slovak uh, society, Alexander Dubček is uh, perceived as a, one of the most uh, consensual and uh, large, uh, main heroes of uh, Slovak uh, modern history. So uh, we can speak uh, regarding uh, 1968 about uh, historical revisionism. For example, uh, uh, the politicians of the opposition politicians uh, accepted the uh, official Russian narration, but also narration spread by Czech Communist Party that they, those were Ukrainians who decided about the occupation of Czechoslovakia in the Soviet polit political bureau of the Soviet Communist Party because Brezhnev and the major part of Soviet party leadership at that time were, were ethnic uh, Ukrainians. Another conflict took place about the uh, recognition of the day of Soviet occupation as a remembrance day of Slovakia. The uh, uh, post-communist parties or uh, opposition parties uh, pro promoted rather instead of this day to celebrate the 30th of September the day of uh, Munich betrayal uh, uh, conducted by Western allies of Czechoslovakia. It is just uh, very important to stress that it was betrayal conducted by the Western allies. Now, uh, conclusions. So this current war in Ukraine escalated the deep conflict within the Slovak society. But uh, it is not uh, just only about some foreign policy co uh, consensus, which uh, is uh, now completely destroyed, but also it is about, also about the interpretation of the key moment, moments of the Slovak modern history, which may per uh, perspectively let, uh, lead to the conflict on the basic principles of Slovakia's uh, current, political, uh, current political regime. Large part of opposition uh, is uh, trying to uh, downplay place Russia's responsibility for the outbreak of the war conflict and even victimize, uh, victimize Russia, and, but also to spread negative hostile uh, sentiments against, uh, against Ukraine. So this conflict uh, will be probably uh, more deep uh, and we must to, uh, be aware really from 80 to 90 percent of uh, people in the country express distrust to the government and the early elections will take in Slovakia in uh, 30th of September this year. So pro-Western choice in Slovakia is not deeply rooted. It is rather uh, was a result of some pragmatic calculations, not just uh, as in Poland or in Czech Republic as a result of some historical experience. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We still have a few minutes, so I would like to ask the public whether there are any questions, questions rather than comments. No, no questions. Um, I'm looking also into the internet, whether we have anything new. Okay, we have Mrs. Domańska. Uh, well, this uh, this issue has been mentioned here, so I'm going to ask this question because I'm wondering why the topic of the war in Ukraine is so uh, separated from the more global issue of American-Chinese confrontation. For me, these two topics are closely interrelated because China is carefully watching Western reaction to the to Russia's aggression in Ukraine. And um, 
the way this war will end will tell uh, China volumes <laughs> about our future ability to, uh, to counter also uh, Chinese revanchism. But it's true that even the Americans uh, see these two topics sort of separately. So uh, my, uh, and, and also there is a broader question of possible you know, um, sort of nuclear race or nuclear proliferation if a nuclear power wins the war in Ukraine and goes unpunished, that would be also a very important negative uh, for us signal uh, for the rest of the world. So could you please explain it to me? Why is it so? Thank you. Uh, which one of you would like to start? Yeah, sure. Okay, like this, uh, I, I definitely can't explain it. <laughs> but I would say that there is a certain connection in Czech politics between both conflicts or possible conflict between US and of the West and China. And usually the comments about the Russian aggression in Ukraine are accompanied in a way. And yet there is still another danger, and that could be China. In fact, if I should simplify it a little bit among Czech politicians of the ruling coalition, uh, people who were not in Taiwan or who at least didn't make a phone call to Taiwan president don't exist. So, so in Czech politics, which today is very pro-American and very pro-Western, pro but it means more pro-American. So I think this connection is somehow, uh, it, it exists. If I may add, uh, I think it is also in a completely different form, but this is also, of course, present in, in Hungarian politics. Hungary is very critical of the American stance uh, in the war, but uh, sees a very important uh, task for Hungary to be in touch with China, just as much as with the United States. So this is, uh, I think it's very difficult for uh, scholar of humanities to say that uh, the, to accept that a politician has different priorities. If a scholar you are connected to certain Western values, that's one thing. But if you are a politician in charge of the short and long term fate of a country, then it's different. And I think this connection, both in, uh, I would say in, uh, uh, government motivated political discussions and in government policies is present, but in a, in a different way than in France. Any other voices? Uh, okay, so uh, in uh, Slovakia, this uh, issue of China, China issue, Chinese is issue is uh, almost uh, not. Uh, present uh, on the level of uh, of politicians, uh, as general, the, um, both political and economic relations uh, with China are uh, quite weak. There are only very um, few Chinese uh, direct investments in the country. So, um, uh, also this participation of uh, Slovakia uh, in uh, this 16 plus one uh, form uh, formula was um, uh, very low and uh, it was uh, uh, openly expressed also by the former Prime Minister Robert Fitzo, now the leader of the opposition, that it were this uh, form format was a format of misplaced hopes. So uh, simply uh, this is issue also on the diplomatic capacity of the country and issue of uh, really lack of uh, interest in uh, this Chinese issue. Would, would you have any other questions? Okay. I have a question for Mr. Fox. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's very important what we have uh, enlightened, uh, the way in which you enlightened us uh, concerning the Hungarian dividends, I would say, in uh, uh, the region. But my question is, uh, about the op political opposition in Hungary, which is a point of view in this uh, regard about uh, we are talking here. What do you mean? <laughs> the political opposition in Hungary is extremely divided. 
So there uh, is only one party which can be considered to be as a political factor, the previous <laughs> Prime Minister Gyurcsány Ferenc position, but uh, they are generally coming up with uh, general statements concerning that we have to share Western values, but they never go as far as suggesting that Hungarian soldiers or NATO soldiers, or not just war material, tanks, etc., but soldiers should go into the war. So in that sense, they are closer to the... To the so to the they, are, they are closer? In or that they sense, have yes, the, yes, yes. Because the same political view of the... Uh, yeah, because they, they didn't, so the opposition didn't make a serious point out of the war. It makes a serious point out of the fact that, according to them, uh, Orban is trying to take Hungary out of the European Union and is moving uh, towards the East, towards Asian authoritarian regimes. But they do not translate this into the context of the war, into the, because it would be extremely unpopular in Hungary to say that well, Hungarian soldiers should go there, and it's not easy to deal also with the Hungarian soldiers who are drafted in the Ukraine. And there are serious tensions over the treatment of the Hungarian minority in the Ukraine. Therefore, uh, such a clearly defined, unambiguous, pro-Ukrainian stance from every perspective is, uh, is difficult. It's a, there is a strong humanitarian solidarity, but at the same time, there is a strong voicing, and this is also what the opposition shares, that the Hungarian minorities' rights should be respected in the Ukraine. This is what I was uh, saying at the end of my presentation, that it's not only the future of Russia, but also the future of the Ukraine is of major concern for Hungary. Okay. Um, I don't want to overstretch your patience, so Burkhard, you wanted to ask two questions, so choose one, the mo more important. Um, I have a question then to my dear <laughs> panelist partners, Attila and Juraj. Uh, well, you, you showed up then the, well, also the differences concerning the policy your countries to do Ukraine. Uh, implicitly that to German, simply by the fact you are neighboring countries to the Ukraine and you are small countries. And um, I understand that to some extent that smaller countries uh, are rather hesitating uh, for a clear, outspoken political statement and have rather, let's say, pragmatic attitude. like. Attila, you stressed it in a Hungarian case. Um, but nevertheless, well, uh, there are some questions about that. Um, how far these pragmatic policy or pragmatic attitudes are led or even imposed by state inf <coughs> information policy? That would be one question for you. And how does it look like in Slovakia? Uh, is it also then a term which used, we have to be pragmatic because we are so small, but the critics of this pragmatic policy also might argue you are playing partners against each other. Um, in particular then when you are saying, well, we have temporary partners, on, but, but this period might end and then we take another one. So that might take, or to give us uh, the impression that you are picking up just your benefits or your economic benefits. I might be wrong, or the critic is, critics might be wrong, but can you give us, us some answers about that? <laughs> yeah. so big discussions about the preparations of uh, exhibition uh, about the aftermath of the First World War. We had discussions, but we said we have one common denominator, peace is better than war. Now, this doesn't seem to be fully applied now, because also, as we heard today, there are quite a number of uh, analysts and politicians who say that peace is pro-Russian stance. 
Uh, I don't think so. So because uh, it uh, it seems to be very pragmatic. So peace should be an option, of course. Under what conditions and how you can achieve peace? That uh, that's a very difficult problem. Now, as far as political propaganda is concerned, I think here. The problem is that instead of talking about the responsibility of the war, it is now speaking far too much about the sanctions against Russia that are causing lots of damage. In my personal view, this is not the right direction because there would be no sanctions without the war, without the Russia-initiated war. Uh, but the ultimate message that uh, there should be no war, there should be no sanctions, but somehow a peace should be. Uh, this is shared uh, by the majority of the society, even by those, I think, who are supporting the opposition, because uh, Hungary has terrible experiences with uh, great powers. And uh, it was, it didn't, uh, bring too much to be involved in the First World War, it didn't bring too much to be involved in the Second World War, it didn't bring, uh, so the, there's a, that somehow uh, the humanitarian uh, support should be our major task and not strong political and military stance on the Ukrainian or pro-EU side. Regarding uh, Slovakia, uh, we must say that uh, government adopted a very uh, strong pro-Ukrainian stance. Yeah, so Slovakia is supplying uh, uh, Ukraine uh, with the, both with the humanitarian aid, but also with the military material, with military equipment, uh, with uh, weapons, and um, uh, on the uh, vice versa, opposition is uh, criticize, uh, criticizing uh, this, uh, this approach. So uh, what's the main argument of uh, opposition? Firstly, uh, the, opposi uh, the peace, but before the uh, argument of Robert Fico were these economic arguments that sanctions do not help, uh, uh, the sanctions do not uh, um, destroy Russia, do not damage Russia but on the other hand, the sanctions are heavily affecting uh, Slovak economy. Uh, it means uh, it is a kind of uh, uh, business, uh, pra big kind of uh, pragmatic argument, then argument of uh, peace, and uh, then uh, argument about this image of, uh, positive image of Slovakia, which has similar roots as uh, the image of positive, uh, this uh, Russophilia uh, in, uh, within the, the Czech society. Okay, at this point, I'd like to finish the panel and thank to all the speakers. I would like to thank our online and on-site audience. <laughs> And I would like to invite you to the lunch break. Thank you.